Well, hey there, good morning, and welcome to Graceway. Thanks for joining us for our new series, Who is Our Neighbor? Jeff is going to be up in a moment to share this week's message titled, Loving Well is a Big Deal. But first, we wanted to let you know about a few upcoming events happening at Graceway. The approaching spring reminds us that warmer weather and baseball are on their way, and our adult and youth baseball softball leagues serve hundreds of families in our community, and we need your help to clean and prepare our fields for the upcoming season. And this is a great activity for families and small groups, so grab your rake and gloves and join us at 8 a.m. on March 29th to help us prepare the fields for this year's leagues. Hey, if you're new to Graceway or if you'd like to find out how you fit into the Graceway family and in God's global mission, be sure to attend our First Steps class. This two-week course starting April 6th at 10.45 a.m. in room 102 covers Graceway's core beliefs and ministry philosophy. We'll also assist you in finding a place of service based on your interests, gifts, and existing relationships. Now, you don't need to register to attend this class, and immediately following our First Steps class, our Directions class, will begin on April 20th, and this relational study is designed to direct your spiritual growth and provide a deeper understanding of the Christian faith. And it's a great way to meet people, develop friendships through biblical community, and find your place to serve at Graceway. So for more information and to sign up for this class, go to visitgraceway.org and click on the Directions button. Safe for Men is a men's ministry that utilizes large group teaching and small group discussion to help men find a place to share, accept fellowship, and edify one another. The group meets every other Saturday from 8 till 9.30 in the Fellowship Hall. And for more information, well, you can find it at visitgraceway.org slash safe. Jesus modeled for us the importance of getting away and spending time with his Father. And on March 21st and 22nd, Graceway small group leaders will be following that example. We're going to be retreating to the student ministry area where we're going to be pursuing God in both an individual and corporate setting. So please pray for your small group leader during this unique weekend. Hey, thanks again for joining us today. If you'd like more information about any of these events or other activities, we encourage you to take a look at the bulletin, visit our website at visitgraceway.org, or check out our iPhone and Android apps. Yeah, good morning, church. Welcome. Glad you're here. Did you like our little theme song, Bring Back Some Memories to You? Okay, that's, that's kind of our little theme for the next several weeks as we go through the parable of the Good Samaritan. Uh, we were going to start this last week. A lot of you weren't here. Glad you're back. We decided to wait for you. So we just cleared off a spot, those of us that were here and had a little time of revival. Uh, it was pretty cool, really, for considering our weather event last week. I was, I was pretty pleased with uh, how God just met with us. You can check it out online, as always. Uh, you might want to go back and check out what happened last week. But this morning, we start the parable of the Good Samaritan. We're going to talk about the fact that loving well really is a big deal. Now, you just saw, visually acted out in front of your eyes, the parable of the Good Samaritan. But what I want to do now is I want us to go back and look at the very words of Scripture. It's found in Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 25. And so find it in your Bible, if you would. And I'm going to go ahead and read this, get it fresh in our mind. We'll be coming back here every Sunday for five Sundays in a row. Luke 10, 25, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answering said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said unto him, you have answered right. This do, and you shall live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Now, there's the heart of the issue. And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his clothing and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. 
But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatever you spend more, when I come again, I will repay you. Which now of these three do you think was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, he said, he that showed mercy on him. And then said Jesus unto him, go and do likewise. This story, I think, is incredibly polarizing. And I think the reason that it is is because all of us in one way or another have lived this story. We have played one, if not all, of the roles, and because of that, I think we can so easily identify with every one of the characters here. We have all justified our lack of love for the world by using religious language. We have all invented biblical technicalities we, we've put everything in dispensational boxes or whatever technique we want to use to be able to justify the fact that this actually can't apply to me as a good excuse for why we won't get involved helping our neighbor. I think we've all been there. I have, just like the Levite and the priest. And, and we've all experienced times in our life, I'm sure of this, when we have been the wounded traveler. And we have desperately waited for somebody to come and help us as a good Samaritan. And just like Jesus, the narrator, we've all seen this play out time and again. Now, those of you who are small group leaders or if you're in a small group, pay attention. Here's a couple of questions I'm going to throw your way for discussion this next week. Just to, this will keep you occupied. Number one, how do we justify the fact, you and me, Nobody else, you and me, how do we justify the fact that we don't really love our neighbor? I want you to think about what are some of the techniques that we use today? What are some of the biblical excuses and technicalities that we dream up in, in order to justify our lack of action to reach out to people in need around us? And, and here's the second question. Who are the people that we do not want to love. Those are two really, really good questions for us to be pondering in our small groups this next week. What technicalities do we use? What excuses do we come up with? How do we religiously justify our lack of love for people in need? And number two, who are the people that we really don't want to love? This month, we're going to be highlighting as we did this morning with Peace Partnership, some of the organizations that we partner with. Actually, we started this a few weeks ago. And, and even when we finish this series on the Good, Samaritan, the Good Samaritan, we won't have gone over all of the organizations that we partner with locally. Because I want you to understand that when we're talking about being involved in loving our neighbor, this is something that is not a one-time activity. It's not something that we get together and everybody does something together as a big group once a year. This is something that goes on 24-7 every day of the week all year long. As you heard John this morning talk about what they do in, in Peace Partnership, uh, I want you to understand when you give to Graceway, Graceway financially is involved with all of these organizations that you're going to be hearing about and have heard about and others that you won't hear about. You are already financially involved as a member of Graceway every time that you give. Now, if God leads you to give above that, I'm sure that John will be doing backflips, okay? That's, that's great. But I, I want you to understand that this is part of what we do. This is the reason that we give. This is the reason that we sacrifice. This is the reason that we talk about the very things that we're talking about right now. We have many, many opportunities to love our neighbor, but the greatest opportunity is also our greatest responsibility, and that's to make disciples. How do we do that? By learning to love well. 
Learning to love God well, learning to love our neighbor well. And, and if we do that, then biblically what is going to happen is disciples result. Now today what I want to do is just give you an overview of the passage, and then each week we're going to go back and look at the same passage through the eyes of one of the principal characters. Each week I'm going to add something new. And each week we're going to go back and look at some of the same things that we have already talked about. In fact, you're going to think that I'm really repeating myself. I am. And let me tell you why. Not loving our neighbor well is a worldview symptom. We started this morning with a cute little song, Who is My Neighbor, all that type of stuff, that, that little kid's song. Uh, here, here's the deal. Many of the problems that we have as followers of Jesus Christ stems from stuff we should have learned in kindergarten, but we didn't. And our environment, our family setting, our school, our society, our own personalities and whatnot, what happens, we begin forming a worldview that teaches us not to love certain people. And the solution to that problem is more than just standing up in front of you for a few minutes on Sunday morning and say, hey, let's do this. And everybody says, yeah. But then many of us don't do that. Because subconsciously, we are programmed to operate in certain ways. And changing a worldview, that's tough. And we have to hear things over and over and over. So we're going to get started, and I'm going to talk right away. Why is this parable so important? Why are we spending so much time here? And one of the reasons is because this parable links to the very core of Jesus' message in the entire Bible. The issue of eternal life itself. Look in verse 25. Behold, a certain lawyer. Now, let me just pause here so that you understand. The word lawyer in the New Testament is not used in the same sense that we would think of an attorney or a lawyer today. These were Jewish legal specialists in the law of Moses. They, they were scripture specialists. And because God had designed for Israel to live not as a church in the sense that you and I are part of today, but he had actually ordered all of Hebrew society right down from a legal system to an agricultural system to a social system to a business structure and finances and all of that. And so a lawyer in Jesus' day was someone who was an expert in the law, and when there was a need or a conflict, someone wanting to understand what does the law really said, say, they would go to one of these lawyers. So they, they do serve a lot of the functions that an attorney would serve today. I just don't want you to have an image in your mind of a modern lawyer. So a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? It's pretty basic. The lawyer asked a question. Not at all uncommon among religious Jews at this time. In fact, it was not at all uncommon for religious Jews to talk about what must one do to inherit eternal life. We still do the same thing today in church, don't we? A lot of times people like me stand up in front of a congregation and we're talking about, okay, what does one have to do to inherit eternal life? So this is not an unusual question at all. And what Jesus does is not unusual either. He answers a question with a question. Very typical common technique by rabbis in the first century. Not at all unexpected. And so in verse 26, he, Jesus, says unto him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? So Jesus is doing the same thing that I would hope that you and I would do today. He's pointing this man right back to the Scriptures. Now, now please understand, he's not really wanting to know how to get eternal life. He thinks he's already got it. He's wanting to know what Jesus is going to say because he's tempting him. And so Jesus points him back to the Scriptures. Now, let's, let's understand something very clearly from the get-go. The lawyer, Jesus, and most of us believe every word of the Scriptures. That's not the issue here. The issue is, how do you read it? 
How do you understand it? So the lawyer gives the right answer. And this too would not have been uncommon or unexpected. Look in verse 27. He answering said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbors yourself. And he said unto him, you've answered right. This do, and you shall live. Now this statement that Jesus makes here is a quotation from two places in what we call the Old Testament. He's quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 6, and he's quoting from Leviticus chapter 19 that we looked at a couple of weeks ago. Now, this, again, this is not uncommon. In fact, we're in, in Matthew chapter 22, Jesus is going to ask this, or a lawyer is going to ask Jesus this same question. That's also repeated in Mark chapter 12. And Jesus at that time is going to give the right answer as well. Now, here's the point. Even the Jews of Jesus' time understood that the core issue of the Scriptures is love. Love for God and love for our neighbor. So let me ask you a question. Is that the core essence of your life? Why or why not? The core message of the Bible has to do with love. Jesus, in Matthew 22, when asked the same question, would summarize it. He says, look, all the Scriptures depend upon these two things. Love God with everything within you. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. Everything in the Word of God breaks down to that. Paul will say the same thing in the book of Romans. You cannot escape it. Have you noticed how people often ask questions to justify themselves, not because they want to know the answer. They want you to know that they know and that you probably don't. We still do that today, right? I, I have that happen a lot of times before or after service. Somebody will come up, maybe I've never seen them before, and it's like, let me ask you a question. They're testing me. They want to know if I know what they know and to show me that they know more than I know. I mean, we still do the same thing today, and I'm sure I've done the same thing to people as well. So this certain lawyer asks what he can do to gain eternal life, but as the Bible says here, the question is not an honest one because he already believes that he has eternal life because he is like you, like me, like Jesus, a student of the Scriptures. His goal is very clear according to verse 25. He tempted him. And then when we look down in verse 29, he has another question after Jesus gives the right answer. So he says to Jesus, he asks him, so who is my neighbor? Now, whoa, 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 whoa. I want you to understand what's at issue here. The issue is not how can I love my neighbor. The issue is who can we get away with not loving? You understand what I'm talking about? That's the issue. This lawyer is not really wanting to know how to get eternal life. He thinks he's fine. He's tempting Jesus. And so he said, well, who is my neighbor? Yeah, we're to love our neighbors ourselves. Yeah, okay, everybody knows that. But who is our neighbor? The issue is, who is it that I don't have to love? Who can I get away with not loving? Typically, even today, you, me, we don't seem to have a lot of trouble in loving people who love us. We don't seem to have a lot of trouble loving those that we want to be like or that we want them to like us. We justify ourselves by leaning on our biblical knowledge just exactly as this lawyer did. And we do the same thing that he's doing. We tend to want to twist the Scriptures to justify us rather than changing ourselves in order to conform to what the Scriptures say. We still have that tendency. I do, you do, we're human. 
We need to recognize that. We all struggle with that tendency. And instead of just seeing what the Scripture says and living it, we tend to say, okay, this is what the Scripture says. Now, let me, let me explain to you what that, let me, let me give you a technicality to show why this doesn't apply to me right now. And then we'll take a cross-reference out of context or two and, and uh, kind of, you know, clap our hands together like, wow, okay, got out of that. Here's, here's what I want us to understand. This is another worldview thing. This is so hard. You've heard me say this many, many times. I'm coming back to it. Why? Because Jesus has said it many times already as we've been traveling through the Gospel of Luke. Here, here's the deal. Listen to this very good. Hearing is authenticated in doing. How many times as we've gone through the book of Luke have we come across this? Hearing is authenticated in doing. Gwen was sharing her testimony from her small group going through the book of James. Wow, they're right in the heart of that. And she was explaining some of the discussions they're having as they work their way through James 1 and 2. Boy, that, that, that's the heart of the issue. The lawyer gave the right biblical answer because he knows the Scripture but he is void of spiritual life, like the devil himself, who knows the Scripture better than any of us, yet is void of spiritual life. You and I also can have all the right answers. We can be teachers and preachers and deacons and void of spiritual life. And I'm not, I'm not thinking of anyone in particular, and I, I'm not trying to be heavy this morning, but I, I just want to be real with you. It grieves me because I know that in this church and any church, there are people sitting right here on this Sunday morning, secure in their religion and void of spiritual life. Because there is no action. There is no doing. First John chapter 3, verse 14, we looked at this a few weeks ago, says this. First John 3, 14, we know that we have passed from death into life because we love the brothers. He that loves not his brother abides in death. Pretty clear. And then a little bit later in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 20, even more clear, John writes, if a man says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he that loves not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? Some of you are liars. You claim to be followers of Jesus Christ. You're not. You believe every word of the Bible, you think. You love to study the Bible. You got all the right answers. But if your heart is filled with hate, you're a liar. And what you have is not real. That's just the way it is. And again, I'm not thinking of anybody in particular, except you over there. You know, I'm not, no. Just, I'm just saying it's not an indictment against this church. We could say the same thing in any church anywhere in the world. You could have said the same thing about Jesus' little church of 12 guys. There was one who was a liar. His name was Judas. Because he allowed bitterness, hate, and resentment to abide in his heart and became an object for the manipulation of the very devil himself, and he was the one who delivered Jesus to be crucified. Don't let that be you. So this is the essence of Jesus' words. You remember when we were in Luke chapter 6, we, we heard Jesus preach the Sermon on the Plain? He was saying the same thing. True hearing is authenticated in doing obedience to God's words. L listen, to, listen to Luke chapter 10 and verse 28. He said unto him, you have answered right this do, and you shall live. So is Jesus teaching that eternal life is by works? Of course not. 
that would be to contradict the entire context of the Bible. This is not to say that we do something to receive eternal life. The Bible is very clear. Who loves first, God or us? God. We love him because he first loved us. Experiencing God's love is essential to doing. The Bible is very clear. We are saved by grace through faith, and that not of ourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, that many of us know by memory. So there's no contradiction here. If our faith is real, real works follow. That's the issue. Is it real or not? Let me, let me go back to what Jesus said there in Luke chapter 6. Look in verse 43. Luke chapter 6, verse 43, very consistent with what Jesus has been teaching all along. This is that passage you'll remember where he said, For a good tree brings not forth corrupt fruit, neither does a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. For every tree is known by his own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth that which is good. An evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks And why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I'll show you to whom he is like. He's like a man which built a house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. But he that hears and does not is like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth against which the stream did beat vehemently and immediately it fell and the ruin of that house was great. Here's what we say today and we're wrong. It's all about hearing and believing. You need to go back and look at the Bible more closely. Here's what Jesus said. Hearing and doing is believing. I want to say that again. We have made this easy believism type attitude. It's all about hearing and believing. And if you do that, you'll go to heaven when you die. Jesus said this. Hearing and doing is believing. And manifest that you do have eternal life within you. We're going to have to work a worldview change in some of us. We make it all reduced to being about us. Hear and believe. That's it. Oh, and by the way, we hope that you live for Jesus. Now, Jesus said, hear and do is believing. You will follow me even to the death. Wow. Wow. In fact, this whole passage is about that. Go back to Luke chapter 10. You you remember inclusios, those literary bookends? Look at the bookends of this passage here. Verse 25, very first verse that we're looking at. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says in verse 28, he said unto him, You have answered right, this do, and you shall live. And then go down to the end of the passage, Luke 10, 37. And he said, he that showed mercy on him, then said Jesus unto him, go and do likewise. Paul, when he wrote the Philippians, talked about this very thing. He said, "This, this is working out your salvation, not working for your salvation. But it's the working out of your salvation. If it's real, it's going to come out. Doesn't mean we're not going to stumble. Doesn't mean we're not going to have bad patches in our life, of course. The Bible talks about that with honesty as well. But the truth of the matter is this. If it's real, it works out. Hearing and doing is believing. And that's the message of James chapters 1 and 2 and so many other places in the Word of God. We tend to think of eternal life as something that we receive one day in eternity. The Bible is very clear about this. Eternal life is something that we receive now. Now, here, by putting our faith in Jesus Christ. It starts now. And if it's real, it changes us. It transforms us. It works its way out of us. And so what the lawyer has just said is absolute truth, 
Love God with all your mind, heart, strength, and soul. Love your neighbors yourself. Absolutely true. Let me tell you something else. It's also absolutely, it's absolutely impossible for any human being to do. That's why Jesus came. That's why we celebrate Easter in a few weeks. Because it's absolutely impossible for any human being to do that. Forget about loving the neighbor stuff, okay? Let's just put that aside for a second. Is there a person here that can say, all of my life I have passionately, completely, and totally loved God with all my heart, mind, strength, and soul consistently without ever failing? You know the answer to that. It's impossible. That's why Jesus came. And if what Jesus did is real, if he really died on that cross, was buried, and rose again, then the life, the eternal life that he gives to us is real. And it starts now. And it's the life of Jesus that begins to ooze out of us because it's our new nature. And we find ourselves loving our neighbors. We find ourselves, whoa, loving our enemies. Because that's what Jesus did. So love for neighbors flows from radical love for God. I want you to think about this. God's image is in every human being. Genesis 1, 26, 27 says that when God created man, what did he make him to be? In his own image, in God's image. Man was created to be relational with God and with others. The very next chapter, it says it's not good for man to be alone. This is God's will for your life and mine. He made us to be relational creatures. Sin separates us from God. But does not erase God's image in us. It's like a broken mirror. If you look at a broken mirror, you can see your image. It's just not totally clear. We were created in the image of God. It's broken because of sin. Not very clear, but it's there. Death is not annihilation, according to the Bible. It's separation. Spiritual death is separation from God. It also affects our relationship with others. That's why so many relationships are naturally broken. It's because of sin. Here's the deal. Who is the creator? God? You've answered correctly, as Jesus would say. If we correctly answer that question, then every human being on this planet is worthy of love and respect in the image of God. And so is all of God's creation because it springs from him. The problem is we don't want to believe that because if we believe that, we will do that. And quite frankly, a lot of times we don't want to love certain people. And John says, you're a liar. You're a liar. Does it mean you have to love people's sin? Who's even talking about that? That's not the issue here. The issue is, will we love our neighbor as ourself? Because loving our neighbor is loving God. Go back to the last chapter, Luke 9, 46 to 48. Luke 9, 46, then there arose a reasoning among them, which then should be greatest? And Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, took a child and set him by him and said unto them, whoever shall receive this child in my name receives me. And whosoever shall receive me receives him that sent me. For he that is least among you, the same shall be great. Now jump ahead with me to Matthew chapter 25, if you would. We all know this passage for the most part, most of us, if you've studied the Bible at all. Matthew 25, verse 34. 
Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, and feed you, or thirsty, and gave you drink? When did we see you a stranger, and took you in, or naked, and clothed you? Or when did we see you sick, or in prison, and came unto you? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you have done it unto the one of the least of these, my brothers, you have done it unto me. And then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger. You took me not in, naked, and you clothed me, not sick and in prison. Uh, you clothed me not, sick and in prison. You visited me not. And then shall they answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister unto you, then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. If we radically love God, as we are told to do, that plays out in the way that we love our neighbor. It has to. It has to. Some of you will give money, but you won't give your time. Some of you will give your, your money, but you don't want to get close to certain people. Mom and Dad, let me ask you something. Are you passing on to your children and grandchildren a faith that does a faith that makes disciples by your active participation in reaching out to the world around you? Or are you passing on to your children and grandchildren a religiosity that sees your obedience to God as sitting in a church and griping and murmuring about everything? But never lifting your finger to actually do something to the least of these. We're being watched. Do they see you passing by need on the other side of the road? And like the priest and the Levite offering religious technicalities as to why that's not your responsibility? Many are willing to teach a Bible study and to lay down a foundation of knowledge, but do your kids see you get down and dirty with those who are hurting, those who are on the margin of society? Yeah, I know it's to be stretched, isn't it? It's being uncomfortable. It's being inconvenienced. Reaching out to your neighbor with the goal, listen to me, of making disciples of Jesus Christ which has to do with life. Yeah, that includes laying a foundation of biblical knowledge. Of course it does. But when you lay a foundation of biblical knowledge with no life, you've passed on a dead faith, a faith that is not authentic. Our, our goal this month is not to organize everybody to, to rally around some great big massive event. Our, our goal is that we all together as the church might grow to have a lifestyle of loving God radically and passionately in order to love our neighbor as ourself. Every day, every way possible. That's the goal, just so that you know. And the result of that is going to be repeated opportunities to share our faith normally, naturally, and to be able to make disciples of Jesus Christ and to reproduce our life in the lives of others. Loving well is a really, really big deal. Maybe your small group could also talk about, so what can we do to love our neighbor? Let's stand and pray together.